This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 39. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. If it wasn't for my tweezers in the middle of the night, Ramsey would have a unibrow. Hello, SE Nation, and welcome back to another episode. Today was a great episode, and I know I say that about a lot of my conversations, but in every interview that I do, I learned something new, and this one was no exception. Today's guest, her name is Julie Hansen. She owns her own company, provides sales training, present, presentation training, and individual coaching. Today, The focus of today's conversation was about presentations and demos, but we also discuss what goes into a presentation. It's not just clicking a few buttons and saying, hey, Mr. Customer, look, it works. And it's not a canned presentation. So we talk a lot, of, a lot about a lot of those aspects as well. And Julie provided a ton of value in this conversation. A lot of great tips in a 45-minute conversation. So it's jam-packed. I uh, hope you enjoy it. But before we go into the show, the quick tip for today is check out the webinar page at wethesalesengineers.com slash webinar. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast the week it is published, then the next webinar is January 26th, and usually it's the last Saturday of the month. And today, this uh, this month's uh, webinar is about building customer relationships. So, now that we covered that, let's jump into the show. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the show. Oh, sorry. Ju- oh, I messed it up already. <laughs> Julie. Wow. Hi, Julie. Julie. There you go. Hi, Julie. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Thanks, Ramsey. Great to be here with you. Yeah, well, that's a bad SE, messing it up right out of the gate. Oh, well, that's, no, that's, uh, you're, you're human and yeah. people like other humans, so you're okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for being here. Uh, I, maybe we can take a second to for you inter- to introduce yourself to my listeners. You bet. So, uh, Julie Hansen, and uh, I work with, as we were talking about Ramsey, I work with SEs all over the world, helping them deliver more impactful demos and presentations. Um, I've been in sales my entire life and I've done demos and presentations and, and uh, wrote a book, a couple books on it, Sales Presentations for Dummies. I also have a chapter just specific to demos in that and Act Like a Sales Pro, which brings in some of my acting background, which I use frequently when I'm talking about sales and, and demonstrations because there's a lot of correlations there. And I also uh, follow a methodology called Great Demo, which is a way to uh, structure and organize a demo in a compelling way that gets your message across quickly, whether you have all the information you not ha- need or not. So yeah, so I do workshops and training and write about all these subjects and um, so looking forward to talking to you about this, how this pertains to SEs today. And you have, you have a, like a website where, with all these resources available, is that Yes, correct? yes. That's uh, performancesalesandtraining.com. All right. Uh, performancesalesandtraining.com. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm just taking a note of that. All right. Sounds good. Well, again, thank you for being here. And since your focus is mostly presentations and demos, I guess that's what I want to focus on. Uh, today for the sake of this interview Mm -hmm. and a lot of times when like when I got the job as a sales engineer I thought I knew how to present I was given the corporate slide deck and voila I'm good to go (laughs) Uh, standard training yes so and I was very good at uh, regurgitating that deck Mm -hmm. but how would you go about actually maybe getting the information for a presentation, uh, put it, organizing it, and then perform, perform it. I know that's a lot of questions in one, uh, one question, but we can start slow. Yeah, so let's, let's pick that apart a little bit. So when you talk about, this is one of my pet peeves, you talk about the corporate slide deck, and I know every company has one, and oftentimes we're called upon to deliver that, um, but especially in a demo, I, I really recommend not starting with that because it's 
you know, we think it's terribly interesting and very important, but our customer is really interested in how are you going to solve my problem? What is, what's the solution that's going to work for me? What have other people in my situation done? And what you're doing when you start with that corporate slide deck is you're, you're, you're setting the tone in a, in a way that's not geared towards the customer. It's not, it's not their top interest. So I would say start with, you know, cut to the chase. What's the most important thing to your customer and start there. And uh, it's rarely how many offices you have or how long you've been in business. That's not the most fascinating thing to most of our customers. So it's uh, starting in the right place, really, really getting a customer focus, doing enough discovery that you understand what it is that they're looking for so that you can be very selective in what you're showing and organizing your content around your customer's interests. So that's kind of the, the front end of things. Um, the delivery, we can get into lots of different aspects of that, how you present yourself, how you carry yourself. But uh, do you want to maybe talk about that organization, that discovery piece, what goes into the, the demo, the presentation. Yes. And then we can talk about kind of the delivery. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm very curious about that whole process. Yes. Great. Great. Um, yeah. So as I said, you have, you know, you have people's attention is at its height right in the beginning of your demo, or your presentation. And so you really want to maximize that experience. And if you start with something that's, if you take too long to get to the point or you start with this long corporate overview, you've really, you really wasted a lot of time. And now the, your audience's attention is starting to dive. Attention really follows this bell curve where it starts out real high and then it just starts to dive down and, you know, hit the bottom and people are, you know, they, people have a hard time paying attention today. And I think, you know, anybody who's presented or, or demoed much understands that and that's really feels uncomfortable when you know you're losing your audience's attention. So part of what you need to do in a demo is structure your, content such that you maintain that attention. So if you do a good job of discovery, finding out what those critical business issues are for your, your customer, what are, they, uh, what are they looking to solve? Why is it important? What's the value in making the change? Um, what specific capabilities perhaps are they looking for? And then you can select those uh, features, those those processes that are going to solve that problem. Uh, what I find most SEs do is try and pack too much into a demo and make a lot of assumptions and show way too much information. And all that does is kind of confuse your audience and water down your main message. And it, and it opens you up to a lot of risks too. I don't know if you've ever shown something because you thought, the, you know, this would be interesting, or I'm on this screen, I might as well show them this. And then that takes you down a rabbit hole you, you never get back from. Or it makes them think, wow, this is super complicated, or I don't need that, so why am I paying so much money? There's just a lot of risks inherent with going off in a lot of different directions. And you also oftentimes run out of time. You know, have you ever done a demo and you just, you know, you, you're answering a lot of questions and um, think you're doing a great job, and then you don't end up getting through some of the most important content. Yeah, I, I was given direction when I first started that I should know every field that I'm sh like. Uh, if I have a like a page on uh, on the screen, I should know what every field does. No one ever said mm -hmm. that I don't actually have to explain those to the customers. Right. So. Right, yeah. right. Just because you know it doesn't mean you have to impart that knowledge onto your your customers. Yeah, like it's um, good. It's good to know that if they ask you a question, but if they don't ask you the question, absolutely. it's not interesting to them and not interesting to you. To move on. Okay. Right, right. And think about it. It's also you don't want to give them everything because there's a lot more power if you hold back some some functionality or some you know let them ask the question because it's much more meaningful if they verbalize it and then you're answering their question. So um, less is more very often in a demo presentation. Um, just, you know, I like to think of it, especially if it's more of an overview presentation, but um, think of it as more of an appetizer than the entire meal. 
uh, you just want, you're trying to get them interested. You're not teaching them how to use the product. And that's what many demos feel like. It feels like we're in a training session. Like you have to think, what do you want your customer to walk away with? You want them to walk away knowing, oh good, I know how to, uh, you know, navigate this dashboard and, and figure out, you know, run this report. No, you want them to know that they have the ability to do that. And this is that cool report that they're going to be able to produce, but it's not a training situation. And, and oftentimes SEs come from a training background and it's, it's hard to switch gears and realize that there's a big difference between uh, sales and training. So to clarify, we're not showing them how to do something. We're showing them that the solution solves their problem. Right. And, and sometimes there's a little bit of how there, but it's not, uh, you know, it can be streamlined. It's not, and then we click here and then we click there and then I got to click there. Um, you know, we're not focusing on all the little steps along the way necessary. We may, we may skip some steps. We may say, uh, you know, this, you know, after five steps we get to, you'll be able to get, you know, voila, you'll be able to get to this, um, result. Okay. So basically, if I understand you correctly, don't go into the weeds. Just m make it interesting and uh, just hit run on the report and show them the report in the end. Right. Um, Somewhat. What, what we, yeah, that's the basic idea. What, what we suggest in, in Great Demo is actually starting with that end result. Because okay. really, that's the most interesting thing to your customers. Like, what is this what is going to solve this problem I have? I have too much information and too many different disparate, uh, you know, system and technology going on. Um, if I start with, okay, here's your, here's your problem as I understand it and a recap what their situation is with them, what they're looking for and get confirmation that everything's still accurate. And then I would present that end result of what they can get that's going to solve that problem. And it may be multiple multiple end results, but I would show, okay, here is a report that's going to uh, give you the aggregate, you know, quick overview, uh, you know, we'll be able to see key metrics and uh, right away in real time, instead of looking at 15 different reports, uh, is this the kind of thing you had in mind? And likely, if you've done a good job at discovery, they'll say, yeah, that looks fantastic. And you say, would you like to explore this a little further? And if they say yes, then you go into your demo sort of demonstrating a couple of things that that dashboard or that, uh, you know, within that, that process that uh, you've determined are of interest to them. So that way it becomes more of a conversation and it also becomes more directed by the customer's interest as opposed to let me just show you what I want to show you. Have you ever heard of a situation where the customer said, "No, I'm good. I don't. I don't need to see more." Sure. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. Ask that. Uh, it can be a good and a bad thing. I mean, if it's if it's somebody on a higher level and they, I show them a dashboard where they're going to get all the information they need in one one place, and they say, "Well, you know," I say, "Do you want to see how it works?" and they don't want to see how it works, that's fine because they're not the ones that are going to be putting it together and figuring out how to change um, different graphics and pull in information. They may say that's fine, and then maybe they've got some tech people that will, well, I'll be doing a demo too, that will want to see the back end, right? So it can be, it can be fine. You've done, you know, a lot of times when you get to a demo, if you've done a good job of discovery and you've gone over, what their what capabilities they're looking for you you match those up with uh, your technology and they've said great come back and give me a demo you're just really going in to sort of prove those capabilities and often at that point people don't need to see the you know the a, a long detailed process or workflow so you've talked about discovery a few times uh, right now and i think you already mentioned this prior prior uh, in this conversation earlier, what are the things that we're trying to get out of a discovery so we can create a good demo or presentation? That's a great question. 
you know, there's a lot of different discovery methodologies out there. And, and uh, I think, uh, the, and I think we need to remember that there's a difference between qualifying and discovery. So qualification is BANT. And a lot of times I hear people say they get BANT as a discovery process. And that's not, that just doesn't go far enough to put together a credible demo. Uh, so there's six things really that I think that you need to give a, a good solid demo that's going to have a good chance of a successful outcome. And um, first is understanding what the person's critical business issue is, which means what do they, what is at stake for them? What is, uh, what does this mean to them to have this, this uh, problem solved? Is it, uh, is it a, a goal, an annual goal or quarterly objective they've got to meet? Is it a, a product that's going out of, um, you know, uh, lifespan? What is it? Then what are the problems that that, so that situation is causing? You know, it's causing, uh, I've got too many, you know, Excel spreadsheets. It's taken me too long to do this. I've got too many people involved in that. So really defining all those problems. Uh, then knowing from their side, what do they have? What, what specific capabilities are they looking for? As opposed to what do I want to show them? What do they say they're looking for? And not necessarily product names, but well, I'm looking for, um, you know, a, a single pane of glass. I'm looking to be able to see every something in, you know, all in one place in real time. And then, of course, which is a little crossover between band, but what is the, when's the timing? When do they need to, when would they like to have a situation, the solution in place? And um, what, what value is associated with making the change? And from those points, we can start to sort of put together a more, more credible demo that will, be tied to the the audience's critical business issue because if it's not really tied to that um, it can be sort of a nicety it's like yeah i'd like to do that someday <laughs> but if we don't understand what their needs are and how important it is to them um, it might be something that just keeps coming back over and over in the forecast so before i move on to my next question you mentioned the term bant a couple of times mm -hmm. I am not familiar, uh, I'm afraid to say, with that terminology. Can, oh, okay. Can you explain that to sure, me? Sure, sure. Um, so BANT is, I don't know who came up with it, but it's basically identifying budget, authority, uh, need, and timing okay. from your buyer. And it's, it's just a way of qualifying. And people call it other things, but that's just a, a little acronym that's thrown around a lot. Okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. So, all right, so... <clears throat> One, usually the account manager does the banting. Yeah, right. They do the banting, but see, banting doesn't really go far enough. That doesn't tell you yeah. why they need a solution in place, what's the problem it's causing. Um, they've got a budget, but you, you don't really know what value is the solution going to bring to them. What, how many man hours are they spending now doing this task, and what is it going to look like with your technology? What is, that, what is the delta? What is the difference there? And right. those are the things that we really want to tie into our demo. And that's what when where the SE comes in. So after the you know, the account manager did the banting, the SE comes in, does the discovery, and gets that all that information with the account manager. Hopefully. Well, sometimes. I mean, sometimes the account manager, the sales rep, gets that. If a sales manager and an SE work well together, and a, and an account manager understands what the SE needs to, you know, deliver and put together a, a solid demo, they'll oftentimes work a little harder to get that information. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a collaborative process. All right. Well, for, from my perspective, uh, usually I like to be the one doing the discovery just because I, you know, uh, I get to actually sit with the customer and understand a little bit better. But if there's sure. an account manager who knows the technology, because in the end, I'm the guy who's doing the demo. I'm the guy who's standing in front of the customer and presenting something that may or may not suit their needs. I'd rather mm -hmm. to be either I got all the information or be my fault that I didn't get all the information versus having to blame somebody else. But right. That's, so that's you have so bottom line responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Always best if you can get it because then you you can pick up on threads that maybe this salesperson might miss, you know, because they can get that information. But you might be able certainly to see more gaps and identify 
other needs and opportunities. Yeah, well, I think it's different for every SE as well. I've been in the role a lot longer than my sales guy, so I have a little bit more experience in catching on those threads. But if I'm joining mm-hmm. a, a new company that the account manager has been there for longer, then I should be able to trust him to do that work. Sure. So, okay. All right. So we get, we did the discovery. We got all the information of what the customer wants to see. Is there a specific way that you would organize that information to show in the presentation? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So as I said earlier, I would uh, start with what's of most interest to them, which is really the solution, right? So it's going to be what is that end result? And I would, uh, you know, if I'm showing them a number of a number of end results, for instance, the number of um, features or capabilities that we have, and they each have a different end result, then I would uh, I'd break those into chunks you know, kind of demo chunks. And I would start each chunk with, okay, so here's, here's a problem you were facing, you know, not being able to see all your information at once. Here's, then I would present that end result. Here's the dashboard, here's the report or whatever that's, uh, that you'll be able to, to have with our solution that addresses that problem. And then we'd explore, then we'd demo just enough to give them a sense of what, uh, how, we got that or things that they can do with that dashboard, et cetera. Then we would go on to the next chunk that is the next end result that is important to them. So prioritizing those end results by importance to the customer. So if they're first, you know, the biggest thing is visibility. I'm going to put that, my, my capability that addresses visibility and that end result. I'm going to, I'm going to get to that first and then I'm going to move through you know, an order of priority. Well, I'm going to start with what's most important to the highest ranking decision maker in the room because you may not have them the whole time. So you don't want to save the part that's most relevant to them for the very end when they may be, uh, you know, heading out or looking at their phone. Okay. And I don't know if this, this is where this comes in. So let me know if it's not. But you mentioned uh, you, you leverage your background in acting. Does that mm-hmm. come in here in the demo? I'm assuming. Or it- sure. You know, I think anytime we're in front of an audience, whether it's a customer or a, you know, an audience at a show, there's there's aspects of performance that apply. And when you're in a demo and you have a, a, a customer or you have several customers in front of you, your job is to communicate that your message and and what your technology can do for them. And it's, you're going to have much greater impact if you deliver that message in a, a powerful and a compelling and engaging way than if, like you said in the beginning, if you just read through your slides and just passed on the information. So uh, it's information is information is one thing, but you, you've got to think about how that's how you're delivering that. So, Thinking about okay, what are my what are my delivery tools as a presenter? Well, you really have, you know, your your technology, your, the demo. That's kind of your your prop, as it were. Then you've got your voice and your body, and you know your passion and your emotion, and so all those things play into how you come across to your customer. And if you're not prepared and you know, you could give a great, you know, on point demo, but if you're, you know, if you're not prepared and you don't know what's coming up next and you feel you are kind of scattered, you're not going to have a lot of credibility. If your voice is hard to hear or it's very monotone, you're not going to keep their attention. If your body language is really, really, uh, you know, subdued or, or, kind of you've shrunk into yourself or you're, you're not making eye contact then you know, you, they're not going to necessarily have the credibility in you that they would have if you were really, you know, really connecting with them. So what, what acting, one, one thing that I try and bring in from acting is that preparation that any performer does before they get in front of an audience, which is making sure you are physically, vocally, mentally in your peak state. And, you know, every, everybody does this in whatever type of performance they're in, whether it's, you know, they're musical musicians or athletes. 
it's just a level of preparation that we don't always think of in business. We kind of get up and, you know, go to an appointment. And the last thing we think about is, oh, am I, am I loose? Am I, am I prepped? Am I, you know, am I in a, in a good space? Am I in peak performance level? Uh, we're just getting our demo together and rushing in and setting up and going through the demo and trying to get all the information out. So being more conscious of what am I adding to this this demo? How am I connecting with my audience? How am I how am I delivering this in a way that that engages people and keeps their attention? Really sets you apart from your competition. From my experience, and this could be different for different folks, obviously. There's no one there to tell you that you need to do all of that. And even still, mm -hmm. like the maximum you'd be given feedback on is your voice was monotone. <laughs> right. So right. How, how would one first off understand that they're doing it wrong or they mm -hmm. could get better? And two, what can we do now that we realize that we need to work on it? Mm -hmm. What can we do to get better at it? Good. Very good questions. You're right. You, It's not something that we're taught. It's you know, like you said, you, you know, in the beginning, you're given a demo or presentation. It's like, get out there and do it. You do get enough product training, but you don't get a lot of training on how to present that in a way that, that, you know, connects with people. So I think the first thing to do is to record yourself, which is often a little frightening. Have you ever recorded yourself doing a demo? Uh, only via WebEx. But uh, okay. I haven't been brave enough to actually listen to it after the fact. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the problem, right? It's scary. Um, so, and recording it by WebEx is great. Um, you will learn so much from watching that. And I always encourage people, you know, watch it with a glass of wine, put one hand over one eye, because you're going to be so hard on yourself. But what you want to do is just look for look for a couple of things. First of all, I say watch it with the sound off. So watch what you're doing physically. What's your, what's your body language like? What's your eye, what are your eyes doing? What is, what's your face doing? A lot of times I hear, you know, SEs tell me about some fantastic thing that their, their technology does. And they'd say it, you know, and if, if I just looked at their face, I would think, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> You know, it's like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't, if I didn't know your, what you were saying, I'd think, ah, that's no big deal. And you want your body to support your message. So poker and face doesn't work in this aspect. Poker face does, no, there's okay. no benefit to a poker face. Right? Right. You, you don't want to be over the top and, you know, d d phony about it. But, you know, most people have technology that does pretty cool things. So it's okay to like show a little, <laughs> a little excitement about that. You know, uh, so that's the first thing I do is watch it, you know, for all this nonverbal body language stuff and just note, you know, note a couple things that you want to work on and then turn the sound on and then just listen for how your how your voice sounds. Are you going too fast? Are you going too slow to too, too, too many pauses, not enough pauses uh, too flat too uh, too many uh, up ending on the up note like everything's a question, but it's not a question that kind of thing. And again, note the things that take you away from or would take someone away from what your message is, because that's really the biggest thing that you can work on is eliminating some of those things that are distracting from your message. And that can be anything that makes it harder for your customer to take in what you're saying and digest it and remember it. And if you can eliminate some of those things, you're, you're way ahead of the game. So, you know, take, making a list and then it, it's hard because you want to fix everything and you can't fix everything at once. So I always say pick, pick one thing, one nonverbal thing and one verbal thing you're going to work on. Like I'm going to work on, I'm going to work on better eye contact. And then you don't want to work on it just in your demos, right? Because usually these habits that we have with, that are physical or vocal, we're exhibiting them in the rest of our life, right? In other areas of our life. So if I'm working on eye contact, I'm going to work on it when I'm with friends. I'm going to work on it with, I, when I'm ordering coffee. 
I'm going to be very aware of it. And you want it to get so that it's more natural for you to have better con eye contact so that when you're in a demo, you're not thinking among the other millions of things you have to think about, how's my eye contact, right? I better make better eye contact. You want these things to become just part of your, you know, part of you, internalize them. So working on them outside of business is really vital to, to getting, making those changes in, in yourself. That's, that's a very good point uh, when you say talk, work, up, work on it outside of business because the way I see it, and I may be a little bit weird about this, but if I compare engineers or whoever is in the professional world to athletes, it's so different how people work. Like athletes practice taking shots or whatever it is that they do, whereas SEs or salespeople we don't practice doing any of that. We just show up to a meeting and expect to actually do it at that time, but we've never practiced it beforehand. So right. what you're saying right now is just practice. Right, right. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about refining certain behaviors, but you know, practicing your demo is a whole nother area that is, that is never really caught on. You know, like you said, it's the, it's the last thing we think about. You think people, uh, think of practice as well i'm preparing it i'm you know as i'm getting this together i'm kind of going through it in my head and it's like no that's not practice right practice is actually like you said like a, an athlete or an actor does like they're saying it out loud they're recreating that uh that performance moment um because there's so many other things that you want to pay attention to when you're when you're giving your demo and in, in front of an audience you don't want to be thinking about what's next or what's the best way to deliver this or um, should I, you know, show, show this s screen here or, you know, you want to be clear of all those little decisions that will take you out of the moment and you want to feel confident. You know, that's just something that that confidence comes across to your audience right away. And <laughs> if they feel you're confident, then they have more confidence in you. It's kind of a, that's exactly what I'm saying, uh, and even I, I I took it a little bit further in the sense that uh, I worked at Alcatel Lucent, I worked at Nortel, mm -hmm. uh, big companies. People don't like engineers walk past each other; they don't smile. We we never smiled, and <laughs> before becoming a sales engineer, it was like I didn't practice smiling. And ever since I've become a sales engineer, whenever I visit a customer the best thing I can do for before I meet him is smile at him. So I never practiced smiling beforehand and became a chore. So mm. since then I just started practicing <laughs> smiling, practicing eye contact, little things like that. It's just Right, right. I mean, it's a, and it sounds silly and minor, but it, it's a huge thing. Like you said, if somebody, you know, doesn't, isn't smiling when you first meet them, you form you form an impression of someone, a first impression in like seven to 10 seconds. So, so much of that is just nonverbal. If I meet someone, they've got kind of a sour face, their tone is kind of flat. What I, I've already made, I've made some assumptions and they may be completely wrong, but as a human, I've made some judgments about this person. And if they're negative, that person is going to have to work really hard to overcome those, right? So if you start off from a good place, from a, a positive impression, like, oh, this person is friendly, they're confident, um, I can't wait to hear what they have to say. That's a much better starting point than, huh, I wonder what this guy has to say. I'm not sure I like him. All right, so someone has prepared the demo, walked into the demo room, mm -hmm. did the demo, was looking at everybody, everybody was giving them like what he thought was amazing feedback, and then they walk out and they never hear from them again. A lot of that could be <laughs> business reasons. Right. A lot of it could be we just didn't read the situation properly and we didn't adjust. What can people do to actually read the situation, read body language uh, in the room? You know, that's a good question. Um, the first thing that reading good body language requires, and this ties back to just what we were saying, it requires your ability to be focused on the audience. And I know sometimes... People say, oh, yeah, the audience was, you know, they were with me. And, and I've, I've seen them demo, and I'm like, how do you know that? Because your head was down the entire time in your computer, right? They were nodding. So, 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you look up and they're nodding maybe once in a while. But the main thing is you got to be prepared enough that you are you are connected with your audience. You are engaged. So number one, be there, be present, be in the moment. And then it's, you know, body language experts. You can you can Google on what different body language, mo you know, gestures and facial expressions mean. And I think most of us are pretty intuitive when it comes to other humans it's like you know i can tell i can get a sense if somebody's not happy or they're or they're into what i'm saying or they're not but body language experts really say to look for clusters of movement movements you know a, a couple different things that you know if somebody has their arms folded and they're frowning that's probably a bad sign but, you know because somebody could have their arms folded just because they're cold or that's their comfortable you know fallback body position so you have to just be aware and notice the the different signals that you're getting and you also need to make sure that you check in with your audience you know it's the easiest way to find out what's going on is to make sure that you don't go more than a couple of minutes without having some kind of interaction and that's easy to say and hard to do because when you're up there and you're, you know, showing software and you're going through a bunch of screens or, or slides, time it just flies and suddenly it's been 10 minutes and you haven't had any contact with your audience. So that's one of the, one of the beauties of breaking your demo or presentation into chunks is there's some natural stopping points there that will remind you to check in with your audience. And I'll also re-engage them and bring the attention level back up as opposed to just kind of letting it, letting it keep going down that bell curve that it does naturally. So being sure to pause and, and give your customers time to ask a question. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think a lot of questions get left unsaid because the presenter is just rushing from one point to the next or they they think they've waited long enough but you really have to wait longer than you think is necessary it's it's really uncomfortable and that's one of those things that that you need to practice is being comfortable with that silence because i may have just shown something that was you know really interesting and and then i i stop and the the customer has been super into it and then i stop say any, any questions and they're kind of going okay first of all I wasn't. Ex I didn't know you were going to stop then, and I didn't know you were going to ask me for questions. So I'm thinking about what I just saw, and I'm trying to formulate what is it I really want to ask about. And oftentimes, before we even allow them to put those thoughts together in their head, we're like, "Okay, since there's no questions, let's go on to, you know, the next topic." Um, so being sure that you give your audience enough time to jump in is really important. So, do you recommend like? clustering spaces for questions or the way I like to do it is have the customer interrupt me just because that way I don't have to actually well I don't know why I just enjoy like having a conversation <laughs> with the enjoy customer enjoy being interrupted well no it's, it, it feels yeah. more like a conversation at that point at least for me than it is for right. just me talking at them for 10 15 minutes before oh, stopping yeah yeah is, absolutely well if you if you follow the great demo methodology it is built around making that demo more of a conversation because we start with that end result. Um, then it's that we ask them, we ask them, is this what you had in mind? Would you like to see it in action, etc." So there's a, there's a conversation happening. There's confirmation. Then we go into the software. We show them a kind of a high level overview of, you know, the, the appetizer of what, what the software does. Um, then, they may ask some questions there, but that chunk is going to be pretty short, like maybe, you know, three to five minutes. And then we would stop there, summarize what we just showed them, pause, ask a question if they haven't asked one. So it gives multiple opportunities throughout the demo to engage with your customer. And, and yeah, if they interrupt, you know, while you're showing something, I mean, I don't consider that necessarily an interruption as much as a like you said, a conversation, that's how we talk, right? It's like, wait, wait, can I see, you know, what'd you just do there? How does that work? Um, but you do need to have a good question handling strategy so that you don't get stuck in the weeds from one of those questions. 
Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So I think what you just described works very well, especially on WebEx, more than like my method of doing things of just hey, interrupt me whenever you can because people on the phone don't like interrupting. They won't. They're, it's a very passive audience. It's a, it's a different deal. That's when it's really important, like you said, to follow that structure of, you know, break, you know, interacting after every chunk and varying that interaction. Like I might ask a question after the first chunk, maybe the second one I've got, especially if you're online, I could do a little, um, do a little poll, quick poll or, um, you know, I just want to mix it up to keep it engaging, to keep people interested. All right. And you, I think you already answered this. Well, you did already answer this, uh, like recording yourself. But is there anything that engineers, because engineer, you know how engineers are great at doing speeches and uh, presentations. Uh, is there anything that we can do to get better at presenting and doing the storytelling in terms of like courses or practices or resources out there? Sure. Certainly, you know, practice is, is the best the best thing you can do. Um, there's there's tons of resources. Like if you want to be better at storytelling, um, you know, there's a lot of resources resources on that. I have a lot of articles on my site about just every specific issue that we talked about, like how to how to work with your voice, how to tell a great story, how to create a story, how to deliver a story. Um, so you know, think about what you really want to work on and pick something to sort of master and get a number of resources around. If you want more help on a topic, there's, um, there's groups that will support you in those, in those areas. For instance, Toastmasters, if you are um, not comfortable getting up in front of an audience or want to work on eye contact or, um, you know, uh, engaging your audience that's that's an option too um, so yeah I mean you have to you have to figure out first of all what do you need to work on what is what area is holding you back and maybe keeping you from really making the impact you potentially can with your customer sounds good uh, I, th I think we've covered quite a bit with, with regards to demos uh, but I wanted to check is there anything else you wanted to to talk about with regards to demos or presentations before we move on to the not so fire round. Uh, the what round? Not so fire round. It's, <laughs> I ask the questions quickly, and you take your time answering them. Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I think I think that's a lot of information, and hopefully, if, if somebody got a, a nugget or two out of that, that's great. But um, you know, like I said, there's 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 other support groups as well for SEs. There's more that are popping up around the country. There's a, there's some SE meetup groups where people get together and, in, uh, and talk about different issues and maybe bring in some people to work on certain skills. Um, but yeah, it's, it, this is a great resource and I, and thank you for providing it. It is my pleasure. So, uh, we're going to move on to the not so fire round. These are questions I ask all of my guests. Okay. And, uh, you can take your time answering them, or you can answer them in a fire round fashion. It's up to you. All right. So the, Let's see what you got. All right. The first question, is there a gadget that every SE should be using? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've seen so many cool gadgets lately. Um, I think, well, every yes, every SE should have a remote mouse. All right. You should have something that you can that allows you to step away from your laptop because uh, that's hugely important. All right. Is there a book or resource other than your own that oh, SE should do? We, we already plugged yours. <laughs> okay. We already plugged yours, and yeah, I know. <coughs> I know. But um, uh, yes, yes. So I think uh, Great Demo is has a book. It's called Great Demo. And it explains the methodology of kind of doing the last thing first, presenting that end result, and um, many of the elements that we talked about today as far as discovery and organizing your demo. All right. Sounds good. Are, do you have any tips or tricks for time management or task organizations for sales engineers? Mm. Well, that's one I'm working on myself. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I have found that... 
blocking my time has been uh, much more effective because, uh, you know, saying from 10 to 12, I'm going to just work on proposals or, you know, one to three, I'm doing discovery calls. Uh, otherwise, I just get pulled in a million different directions. The common objection, so I love that method. That's the way I use it. The, the yeah. common objection I, I get from sales engineers is that their account managers will not allow it or they'll try to overbook them or their customers will uh, try to overbook them. Uh, how, how you know, it? yeah, it, it's not perfect. Um, I think if you can, if you can kind of use that as a framework and certainly there are days where I have days where like yesterday I had it perfectly planned out and it didn't go anything uh, like I thought it should. And it's just going to be like that. But if, if you can do that, you know, 70% of the time, I, I think that's, that's great. Um, and I think you need to, you know, you need to work with your account manager to, um, you know, if, if you can show the benefit to them of particular time frames. like if I'm able to do this, I'm going to be able to get that demo done faster, or it's going to be more, if I can focus on this time for discovery, it's going to be a much more uh, credible and um, spot on demo than if I had to just kind of piece it together and you know when I had time. So exactly like a demo, show the value to your account manager. Yes, exactly. You got you got to sell sell your sell to your account manager. Every, everything we talked about, do to your account manager. Perfect. Uh, last question: uh, What is the best advice you would give uh, sales engineers? Mm. Gosh, I think I just, I love working with sales engineers because they're just smart uh, people that want to help customers, you know, solve their problems. And I think just, just owning what you do and really understanding what a valuable role you have and just showing up and being, you know, being a trusted advisor and not letting somebody who's a director of IT or somebody in C-suite make you feel uh, you know, less than, than who you are. Um, so meeting people, I was, I talk about status a lot. It's something we use in, in acting as well. It's like, um, how you feel about yourself in relation to another person. And that affects your voice, your body, uh, the words that you choose. And if you come, if you assume equal status, when you walk into a room, um, you just have a different air of confidence about you and it changes everything. So I would say just, you know, own who you are, assume equal status, and, you know, it, n not every solution is right for every person. So, um, but you get to show up and be the best you can and feel good about that. That is a perfect piece of advice, and I'm going to end on this high note and call it a day. Okay. Th thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> this was awesome. Thank you, Ramsey. It was quite a fun. All right, I'll uh, talk to you later then. Thank you. Okay, Bye. thanks. Bye-bye. So as I mentioned in the intro, this was an awesome conversation. And I usually re-listen to the interviews before I write the intros and outros and write up the show notes. And every time I listen to this one, all of them in general, but specifically this one, I learned something new. The one thing I want to highlight is I knew I have to practice presentations or demos before. It's not like it's not a secret. Before every presentation or demo, you have to practice. Hopefully, you're practicing along the way before you actually have a demo or presentation. The tip that I enjoyed here from Julie is that, like, I never thought about recording myself specifically, but also listen, watching the demo without a sound, which is counterintuitive, but. It makes sense. You get to see the way you look and your facial expressions, what message you're conveying without actual sound. So that was great. So thank you, Julie, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new from it. Before you go, if you like books, you like reading books, you might want to join the book club on wethesalesengineers.com. You can sign up to the book club at wethesalesengineers.com slash book club. And I look forward to chatting you, with you on the next episode. With that, this is Ramsey signing off. Hello. Hello. Hello.
Low.